Thanks to you all for hanging out with me today and inviting me to come, come talk with you. My name is Adam Gamwell. Uh, and as Shan Fan said, I'm a, I'm a design anthropologist, and I'll talk a little about, a bit about what that means. Uh, and then I, I do podcasting also, so I want to talk about sort of the mix of some of the things I'm building, which is using anthropology and ethnographic research and observational research to do podcasting. And then uh, I have this term I want to think through with you all called charismatic data. Um, and this is just some ways of using social science to think about how we might uh, spread the word of conversation. So today, if you want, uh, I, I threw this little hashtag up, T-A-L Pivotal. T-A-L is, is the name of my podcast, it's Anthro Life. If you want to hashtag anything on Twitter, um, I'd be happy to hear from you, because this is, you know, podcasting for me is about conversations, and for all of us. And so if you want to, you're welcome. You can, you can tweet at me, Gamwell, or at T-A-L Pivotal, and I'll have a live share at the bottom uh, of our talk, and that way we can just have tweets. If people want to tweet anything, please feel free to do so. Particularly, I want to, I'd love to know, what are your favorite podcasts? Who do you listen to and why? Do you have a favorite host? Do you like Guy Ross from TED Radio Hour? Do you like Ira Glass from This American Life? Uh, and why? Or do you like Dan Car Carlin's Hardcore History? You know, what, what, what's your, if you're a podcaster, does anybody listen to podcasts, by the way? Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So if y'all want, I'd love to hear about sort of what uh, inspires you in terms of podcasting, who your favorite hosts are. Any quotes or things you have from today that, that seem nice or interesting or not? Uh, questions and comments or any photos, just you know, if you want to use it, it's just kind of a place to play. Um, I learned about this thing called Everwall yesterday, which is like these, these tweet walls you can buy, which sounds weird to me, but you can uh, pay for them. And then when you're at an event, people can tweet to this either a hashtag or an at name, and then a bunch of cool stuff shows up. And so it's a nice interactive space after, after talks usually. Um, anyway, so if you want, hashtag TAL Pivotal is available, which I made yesterday. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about me, because my story is integrated into what I want to talk about today, uh, as well as, you know, help sort of give a framework of what we're looking at. Uh, so I am a design anthropologist, and sort of what that means, we'll talk about what both design and anthropology have to do with each other and what they don't. Uh, but so I look at doing social research on cultural systems, uh, and I do systems thinking usually for good. So the idea is to do research on people for good, for impacts, to sort of help uh, with the effectiveness of programs and ideas, as well as to facilitate communication between different groups, usually multilateral groups. I'm also a podcaster and producer for This Anthro Life. This is my main project, but I also work on a number of other smaller ones. We're developing a podcast network, actually, of a bunch of different uh, socially-minded podcasts that's, that will be coming out eventually. Uh, and so, and also I can work as a social strategist, consultant, and educator. This is my, my main work is doing public education. I love doing this kind of work, and uh, I plan to build a lot more sort of public educational initiatives, starting with podcasting and then using other tools to sort of leverage social conversation. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, so just to give a, a quick view of where I'm coming from, my path to design thinking and how I use it in DA or design anthropology. Uh, so I'm completing my PhD in anthropology right now at Brandeis University, as Sean Fan said. Uh, now this may seem a little weird, but uh, so I do research on quinoa agrobiodiversity conservation, uh, as well as markets in southern Peru. Does anybody here eat quinoa? Does anybody here not eat quinoa? I guess it's <laughs> better. Or you will if it's on the table, right? Um, but so I was, I was in Peru from, for 18 months, from March 2015 to August 2016, and so there, uh, normally anthropological research, if you're going through the academy, is this idea that you're supposed to do observational research but not really have an impact, which to me is kind of impossible because you're actually there working with people. But my research was framed around working with an NGO called Biodiversity International that does conservation programming and research for development and conservation. And so I was struggling with how to do this kind of research while having an impact, but also doing what we call academic research. So design thinking and design anthropology gave me this sort of toolkit to think through it because it's this mix of observational research and ethnographic long-term study with people alongside interventionist policies and what we call speculative intervention. So in the work itself, I worked with multilateral stakeholders uh, from government ministries to international NGOs to scientists, researchers to indigenous farmers and entrepreneurs. So I learned how to talk a lot across a lot of groups. Uh, and so this is a very formative experience for me to understand what it means to translate ideas across different kinds of interlocutors, different kinds of people, different kinds of knowledge sets. Particularly because if we're talking with, um, I work with geneticists a lot, and we did a lot of research on genetics of quinoa, and then I would have to take and translate that idea to farmers. And that's a very different thing because farmers generally are not geneticists, even though they are known as the genetic safeguarders or guardians of biodiversity. So there's interesting conversations that go back and forth. Part of the work then is to figure out how do we talk about different ideas of knowledge, expertise, across different you know, lateral groups. And so for me, again, it's focusing on the idea of design and how we design programs. Much of design thinking is, is um, I think you do a lot of it here at Pivotal, is to iterate ideas and talk across groups and think together and sort of form ideas collaboratively. So I drew from that. Uh, by the way, too, this is a totally open conversation. So if you guys have any questions or comments you want to shout out at the time, that's, that's, I'm happy to do so. We can have Q&A at the end if you want as well. But 
Um, I always do my podcasts and talks like this just as an open conversation. So feel free. I know it can be weird because you're all facing me and I'm facing you. But uh, this is a conversation is, is as much as, as we want it to be. So, so anthropology itself, right, if you have or have not heard of it, right, is this holistic study of humankind. And we generally put it into four subfields. Cultural or social, and that's the kind of anthropologist I am. I study cultural systems or social systems of people. There's linguistics, which studies language, phonemes, like the structure of language, as well as how we use language and culture. I see we got a shout out for linguistics there. Um, there's archaeology and material studies. This is the Indiana Jones, where you get to study all the things on the ground, usually. Uh, and then there's biological and physical, which is things like uh, anthropometry and how people sit in chairs and how we design things and skeletal structure, our teeth structure, our bones, etc. What's kind of fun for me is that digital technologies like podcasting use all of these. And so it helps me think across all four subfields and how we might use them to, to work together. As I said, anthropology itself as an academic discipline can be very academic in that it tries to sort of do research but not have an impact. As a design researcher, design anthropologist, I then move these into thinking about social technologies is how I like to think about these. And so some of the tools that anthropology helps us use is put in context before events. And this is one of the things that we try to do with our podcast at TAL is when, if, there, if there's a bombing in Syria, which there was, was last week, if there's, if there's different social events like this, rather than saying we're going to react to a certain event saying this is good or bad, what we can do is say, what is the context around which this event took place? Why did it even take place? And this is something that American politics is terrible at doing, which we try to do and try to put conversation back into things like that. Uh, and so anthropology is particularly good at that because it's known as taking a holistic view. It takes all these different pieces into perspective as well as tries to put them in historical and social context. Um, another good technology that we can use is differentiating attribute or group or cultural data types. And so these are two types of data that we collect as anthropologists. Attribute or individual data is sort of how each of you are dressed right now, right? A cultural or group level analysis would be that you all dress similarly, and that's sort of the pivotal dress, right? That's sort of a culture of dressing in a, in a specific way, right? So even though you may have a t-shirt, you may have a button-down shirt, you may be wearing sandals, you might be wearing chucks, whatever it is, we can look at and say, in a cultural level, we're seeing a pattern of dress, that people dress a certain way. If you go down the street to MGH, people will be wearing suits, right? And so there's just this idea of cultural data versus attribute. We need to be aware of this, too, when somebody, a talking head, says, oh, this is how this is, or this is my opinion. Uh, we can realize, is, is they, are they speaking as a group or are they speaking as an individual? And this helps us differentiate where ideas and opinions come from. Uh, another piece is that value making, how we evaluate things, why things matter to us, right, is about having communities of meaningful difference. And so when we have groups, we can choose who we affiliate with. Um, you know, let's say friends or the family that you can choose, right? And so with this, we talk about this is how we show things that matter to us and what, what values do we have. We learn to say, we're different from you for these reasons, not in a negative way, but just saying this is what defines us, and this defines a different group. Um, another piece we can use is holding space for multiple voices. And so what this would mean is that we're not here to say, your voice is right, your voice is wrong. But the fact is that as an ethnography, as, a, as an anthropological piece of research or technology, we have space for all voices. And the idea, of course, is that in the social world, there are all voices, right? This is not about coming to a consensus saying one is right and one is wrong. And then this, this piece, I think about this because, and I love This American Life, and I don't know if you fell listen to other podcasts too, there's always this aha moment at the end of the show, right? Where, you know, it's like, oh, we, got, we figured it out. We have the recipe for Coca-Cola or whatever. Great episode, by the way. You know? Um, but in anthropology, and also just in everyday life, there usually isn't an aha moment every day. If there was, that'd be, like, every day would be amazing, wouldn't it? Like, I go home and I have my aha moment. Like, yes, I figured out how to work my toaster or whatever it is. So that we tend to not always see those. Uh, so I, I want to take these pieces of these sort of social technologies from anthropology and then map them into what we see as, as the podcast cosmos. Uh, and so these are, this is the world. We sort of did an anthropological look at what's happening in podcast land and so what kind of podcasts exist. And this is just a way of thinking of uh, what kind of information is out there. And so we came up with five types that we see the most often. If, if you see, think of another one, let me know, because I'd love to see other kinds. Because uh, I think there's probably more than this, but this is just what we have time to think with, you know. Um, there's the scripted story. This would be like 99% invisible. Has anybody ever heard that from PRX? Cool. Yeah. Um, and Planet Money also is a more, probably a more famous one that's on NPR. There's the open conversation, which is like Slate's Culture Gab Fest, or the Duncan Trussell Family Hour, or Aubrey Marcus Podcast, if you've seen those. Um, there's the serial audio drama, which is what most people come into podcasting for now, which is like S-Town and Serial, you may have seen, or, or uh, Fugitive Waves. If you haven't heard of Fugitive Waves, though, it's, it's also amazing. It's made by the Kitchen Sisters, and their, their subtitle is Movies for Your Ears. It's totally awesome. So it's just these like 20 minute different stories every week, full cast, full audio, very cool stuff. Uh, there's the expert interviews, and this is where you'll see the Society for Cultural Anthropology. This is, you probably have not heard this, this uh, podcast called Anthropod. That is where usually students will interview professors about something they're researching. Uh, and so I'm putting this specifically because you don't see too many of these actually just in the general category of podcasting. This tends to be like academics doing this kind of work. 
Uh, and then talking to a friend last night, he helped me think of this one too, information downloads. And this is like Dan Carlin's hardcore history. That's four hour episodes that just dive into the Ottoman Empire you know, for four episodes in a row. So 16 hours of, of, of mega stuff. Um, did, these, did these sound like podcasts? Those of you who listen to podcasts, do these sound? Is there anything else that you have, that may have heard of that we haven't seen here? Or examples that really strike you from any of these? Like where might we put this American life in here? Sorry. Script a story? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard new podcasts that might just more people. Yeah. That's a good point too, though. You should think about it. You're right. News is, is a good one too. You gotta have the news, otherwise, what's happening in the world? Cool. Um, so this is my podcast. This is called This Anthro Life. And so what I want to talk about today is this notion of conversation plus podcasting as a social technology and what that might mean. And so podcasting came into my life uh, early in my graduate school career where uh, myself and my colleague would often go to the bar after work and argue angrily about anthropological theory. Like, this doesn't matter. What is, what is the point of this? You know, or like, we're trying to figure out what's, what's happening with this idea or that idea. And we kind of, you know, argue with things like Marx's labor theory of value and other, other words that you don't even, what does that even mean, right? Uh, and then we realized, you know, actually, we could, these are conversations that we're getting to something. Like, we're, it's not that we can, like, talk about anthropological theory, but the fact is that there's something that matters to us about why these conversations are happening. And what if we reformatted them to be publicly accessible? Because one of our challenges, of course, if you do graduate school or any sort of advanced study, is that you may find yourself not being able to share information with other people because it's super specialized or super jargony, right? Um, and the same thing with like, you know, if you're, if you're a super mega programmer, it can be hard to talk about what C++ or, you know, agile means to somebody who like is a PE teacher, right? Um, and otherwise, you know, you might know what dodgeball is, but you may not know what kinesthetics are, right? And so it just depends on, you know, what languages you're talking across. Uh, and so for us, we, we realized that doing this kind of podcast was helpful for us because it began with like, we think is the backbone of academia in terms of we are expert researchers, we've learned how to do it, but then uh, we built it in the form of being conversational for everybody else. Um, also because we think that, as, as I'm pointing out with these ideas of social technology, that it's really cool and useful to share these ideas, we think. And so um, this has been kind of a fun thing to, to build together. And so we are now almost about five years old. We'll be five in, in, in August or September. And uh, it's, it's really great to see. I mean, we have over 18,000 subscribers now, and we have 90 plus episodes. Uh, and they range from 45 minutes to 25 minutes. They're now 25. They used to be 45, but realized that was too long for people's commutes. They told us. And so then now we cut them in half. Uh, and, you know, so we're looking at about 6,000 downloads per week on average. But this week we're doing actually about 15,000, which is really cool just because we are doing a crossover series I'll, I'll talk about with a, with a, a big blog. Um, and we also we've partnered with a lot of major institutions for us, like the American Anthropological Association, uh, this online digital group called Sapiens, which is run by the Wintergrins. Uh, Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Society for Applied Anthropology, um, and so we just we just sort of built this from the ground up as a set of conversations, and it's been it's been really cool to see it uh, taking off more and more. And so I want to use this as a as a platform to think about the idea of conversations as a form of social technology, uh, and then when we put them with podcasting as a form of digital technology, we can amplify the meaning and the power of what it means to have a conversation, and what the point of a conversation uh, would even be. So. My kind of thinking with this is that conversations themselves might be like little laboratories, you know, and this is sort of the space where we all, in between you and me, who I think I am and who you think I am and who you think you are and who I think you are, in that space of when we talk, that's where we define who we are. And so that's what we call the conversational space. And this is, you know, in, in anthro speak, that's called intersubjectivity, but we don't need to worry about that. But the idea is so conversations are where this happens. This is where we define who we are, who you are, who I am. We have our little laboratories of ideas that we can think about uh, what that might mean. And so what's been fun doing this, this podcast, doing it as this open format conversation. And so as I said, this one, the, uh, the open format one, number two, is what we, we shape TAL as. And we don't do it as a scripted show, partially because this is not our full-time job yet. We don't have time to make a nice scripted This American Life show. We make weekly episodes. Uh, and, and the other thing is, though, because it's a conversation, we actually have it open to people. And so we, you know, we record them, but we're actually hoping to one day have the time to come do these as live casts on Facebook or, or Twitter or through, through is it Periscope, I think. You know, whatever the tech is, so we can that way we can have these live casts and people can tweet in, we can talk to them during the show. We used to do this at a radio station. We did have people be able to call in, but that feels really weird and archaic right now for some reason. But so if we can live tweet it, you know, we'll, we'll do that. Um, but so the idea is like this has taught us to be cool going with the flow because the convert, like we began this with three people and then we had four, now we have two uh, that run it. And so uh, it's kind of gone up and down. You've got to be kind of good with the flow in terms of how people can and what time they have itself because this is largely, I mean, it's a volunteer organization right now, but 
you know, it's, it's creepily taking more and more of our time, which is great, but we like that. So I want to talk about some of the kinds of episodes that we've done, and so these are just examples of how we have conversations on the show. Um, these, are, these are listings of the three, there's three of them, for example. Um, and so we've had one that was on emojis plus hieroglyphics, and so the idea with this is, you know, we all use emojis, right? I imagine you all do when you're texting or tweeting or whatever, right? Um, are they the same thing as hieroglyphics? Right? We, we're asking this question, like, as, as, as thinking linguistically, like, what do hieroglyphics as pictorial writing tell us about emojis or Maya hieroglyphics, right? Uh, and so it's, it's kind of cool. This helps us differentiate the ideas of like logographic versus ideographic writing. Ideographic means that the image represents an idea. Logographic means you can pronounce it. Obviously, you can't pronounce emojis, right? There's no, you can say burrito if it is a burrito, if it's an emoji burrito, but there's no word that is burrito emoji, right? Yet. But, um, but so just to think about that, and obviously, Egyptian hieroglyphics you can actually pronounce, and that's one of the differences. But just what is it about the human spectrum and the human way of thinking that we like pictorial writing? You know, emojis are way more fun than letters, right? I think they are, but, you know. But the thing is, they're, of course, up to interpretation, right? This is one way of saying when pigs fly. Uh, but one of, the, one of the cool things, when they started doing emojis in the late 1980s, actually, which is crazy. Um, you don't know the story of emojis, by the way? Oh, man, you do? Do you? Maybe a little bit. Um, it's a very interesting, we have, you can listen to it on the episode, actually. But, uh, so I won't go into too much detail, but it's very cool because it was invented, they were invented in Japan uh, because people in Japan love to take photos and send those over text rather than texting letters themselves or, or kanji characters. And at the time, that like was like mega bandwidth problem because they were sending pictures over like you know 28 bit K dial up internet. You know, so like it just destroyed the bandwidth. And so they, they like basically Japanese telecom paid this guy to invent little symbols they could send then send instead of pictures themselves. And so it was really just a data problem, which is interesting. And then from that, it just sprung into this, this global phenomenon of different ways of communicating. Um, but anyway, so that's a kind of a fun story to dig into. We've also done uh, guest episodes, and so the, the emoji one is just me and my, my colleague Ryan Collins. We, we host the episodes, but then we've had increasingly more high-profile guests, which has been fun, uh, particularly this year and, and the end of last year. And so on actually the day after the election, we had Hannah Brencher, who's she's the creator of morelovelettercom which is a wonderful, wonderful idea about writing handwritten, handwritten love letters to people and sharing them, especially kind of programs where you can share love letters with anybody. Like you can go sign up and then they'll say, we need to send love letters and we'll send like 50 of them. People can write them and send them to a certain person if they need some help, extra love, if they're in the hospital, whatever. It's a great idea, right? Because she was, she said, you know, she used to suffer from depression and so she would actually write love letters to strangers and put them in the New York library in books just to be found elsewhere. And it's just say, hey babe, glad to see, glad you're here today. Love, love me. And that's it. And so she'd just like anonymously drop these letters. So it's been this incredible phenomenon to see. So we actually had this on the day after the election. Uh, and, and so it's a very interesting day because, and, you know, if you're in Boston, depending on your politics, it may have been a good or a bad day. Um, but we did this as, as a reminder, again, in terms of context of why we need kindness, why kindness matters to us, like especially when days may seem dark or dangerous. And so we can do that. Another piece we've had this year, we had Hamilton Morris, who's, who's a vice correspondent who does Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. Has anybody seen that show? You know what it is? Okay, super interesting. It's about drugs. Uh, and it's about what it means to take drugs. And, and so, in the science and the stories behind him, he's a chemist. And so we did an episode with him that like, asks questions about what it means to call something medicine or call something a drug, call something a psychedelic. And, and so we dug into these issues of, you know, if you're talking about ayahuasca, which is a, which is a, a sacred plant to a lot of Peruvians uh, and Amazonian people, it's, 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 an, it's a hallucinogenic, but it can uh, you know, it's, it has incredibly therapeutic properties. And so it's treated as a medicine amongst them, but there's a big influx of drug tourists, of people seeking psychedelic experiences they want to trip out. Uh, so they go to Peru just for that. You know, so it's Machu Picchu plus that now, right? Um, and so we talked about what does it mean between those two things? Because is it, is it still or is it not a medicine somehow? Uh, or is it a drug? And so what does it mean to think through these pieces together uh, as a conversation saying that actually it's, it's all these things? And uh, that can be a bit of a challenge, but it is part of this conversation. And so this is, was sort of our piece of thinking what it would mean to have these kinds of conversations. And our hope is that by, by bringing in these you know, general speakers of anything and everything human, uh, we can sort of strengthen this idea of conversational technology. Right? That it can adapt as, as humans adapt. Right? And so the idea is, how do we have these kinds of conversations in a way is with what you want to say increasingly, you know, some of that could be very controversial, some of that might not be. You know? And so just thinking, how do we talk across all these things uh, together? And so we come to this idea that, that, I, I, that podcasting has done to me is that open format podcasting in this case, right? That we don't script our shows ahead of time. We write notes down like I have. I have some notes on my iPad, but I'm not reading them, and they just sort of tell me where I'm supposed to be at. Uh, and so for us, 
open format podcasting like this is an invitation to conversation about what matters, right? And this is why we have these kinds of conversations. We may bring in Hamilton Morris, we may bring in one of y'all if you want, to talk about working at Pivotal or what it means to be a programmer or a project designer or whatever that is or mean to work in a group. But if we do that, the idea is to then talk about what matters to you. And, like, and so we get into this and conversation is about doing that. And uh, I think that this has been one of the, the great things that we've seen um, in doing this, this kind of podcast. So I want to share two quotes. I'm going to look through, through a couple of quotes we've seen from the show. So we are doing a, a, um, a crossover series right now with this anthropology blog called Savage Minds. And they're about 15 years old, which is pretty impressive for a blog to be 15 years old and still existing. Um, but anthropologists are either behind the time or what, I'm not really sure. But, uh, so our first episode, we had Alex Golop, who's one of the writers. He's, he's the founder of Savage Minds, or one of them. And so we, we're having this open sort of dialogue with these different anthropological groups for the month of June, this, this month. And so we, actually, our fourth episode comes out tomorrow. Uh, and it's just talking with anthropologists themselves about why anthropology matters. So it's kind of a specialized language. But the thing is, what's been really cool about these conversations is that they have brought out the idea of conversation. And uh, not because we're talking about ourselves as anthropologists, but uh, these, these pieces that like there's something that conversation has that other forms of communication do not, that has some way to change people's minds. So I really like this, what Alex Golub said, is that the point of a conversation is to change somebody's mind. It's not to say that you're right, it's to change the mind. It's sort of say, let me dislodge maybe what your perspective is, and then let's think about something in a different way. And so think about that in terms of, again, we talk about this, right, this intersubjective space of where conversation can happen. In this idea, right, this is where minds can be changed, which is weirdly enough right outside of your mind, in between you and somebody else, right? So we said this in conversation with this idea about critique. And so uh, we really got into the conversation about the internet and, and you know, the open web and what it's like. So we'll read this, we'll read this quote and we'll talk about it. So Zoe Wool was the other guest on our show. She's from Rice University. So she says that critique is not about judging or assessing something as good or bad. It's about bringing into relief the structures through which something is evaluated in the first place. And so we put these two pieces in conversation. The idea of conversation can change somebody's mind. That's the point of it. And the will is critique as a way of understanding what structures we use to evaluate something as part of that conversation. We were, we were discussing this in relation to internet trolls. And so what internet trolls tend to do in the open access world is, right, they just yell at things and say, this is bad, this is stupid, I don't like this idea, right? That's denouncement, saying, no, this is not good, this is evaluation, and that's it. That doesn't help anybody, and there's no conversation there, right? It's just saying, this is stupid, I don't like it. Nobody likes trolls, right? Maybe in the movie Trolls, but, you know, minus that. Um, although I've actually never seen that movie. Is it good? No? Could be. <laughs> Unknown. Um, but so the idea with critique, again, is that this is the format of using conversation, right? This is not about saying this is good or bad, but understanding how do we evaluate something in the first place, particularly if we're talking about ideas that brush up against ourselves and say, oh, this is not, this is not what I like. Uh, this makes me think. You know, what, what is happening here? Like, are, are, is ayahuasca a drug? Is it a medicine? I'm not really sure. You know, is kindness the answer when like, being nice when we need to fight back, right? What, what, what are we doing here with these, these kinds of conversations? And so critique helps us think about saying, why are we evaluating this as good or bad in the first place? Or how are we doing it, right? And then it's a moment and kind of opportunity to step back and say, let's slow down our reasoning for a second and say, you know, what's happening here? I like it, actually. So Alex Golub likened the internet. He said that, you know, we, we have the open access internet now, and then uh, he likened it to sort of a freshman that has just gone to a liberal arts university for the first time from their small town. And so they, they're, like, they're now first seeing new things that they didn't recognize, and so we're not quite a senior yet. We have, we have a couple more years, I think, as the internet, as, as the inter internet of humanity uh, to sort of come of age, he says. And so we, that's why we see so many trolls right now anyways, because they're, like, we're learning what online etiquette means when we're talking about in a purely public space. Kind of a funny idea. You know. So I want to talk about three points to, to bring us into the second part here. It's like, what does podcasting show us then? You know, we talked about conversations as means to, to change people's minds and using critique as a form to do that. Uh, and so as the anthropologist, I want to ask, what does the podcasting look like to an anthropologist? Uh, and so we'll look at, look at three ideas that uh, we, can, we can think with together. So one is that the web is inherently public, and this is where podcasts live because they're digital, right? There's no tapes of podcasts that I know of. Maybe there, there totally could be, I guess, if you want to like go retro. And, you know, they, still, they still sell tapes sometimes at concerts, you know, if you go, especially in, I've seen in Brighton. So just in case, we could have some tape podcasts, I don't know. But, uh, so the idea is like, so for, for, for podcasting itself, right, this is where, where, where podcasts live is this web, which is this inherently public space that everybody who has access to the internet has access to. And so what does that mean? In the public, everybody has a voice. They may not be equally distributed in terms of how loud and, and how quietly somebody might speak, 
But the idea is that because people can have a voice in this space and we all have access to it, learning to converse is critical, right? And learning to converse as a human is critical, right? And we might even call this a civic duty if you want. Like there's no, there's no other sort of civic laws of the internet, but you've heard different groups probably talk about this stuff. Electronic Frontier Foundation would be one of them. Um, and so my thinking is that podcasting is a technology that we can use, a social technology to demonstrate conversation and critique. And that's what we're trying to do with this Anthro Life is showing what it looks like to have a conversation based in critique, not in denouncing something in adding more than one voice and not saying, aha, we figured it out, but saying this is actually how complex social life is, right? And so how do we live in this space? That's one. The second, we might think of this as podcast as cultural brokers. I'm gonna give you an old school anthropological term and a new school one. This is from 1956, so. Uh, and the idea is this actually came from, from an anthropologist working in, in Mexico and trying to understand how local farmers would talk to unions as well as how they would talk to politicians when they came to town. And so I think we can adapt this idea for today. And the idea is that a broker is somebody that operates between, in this case, local and community orientations. We might think of this today as a small town or even an office team, if you, work, if you work just here. And so people that broker between local and community orientations as well as these international or mobile oriented groups. And so you can think about this in terms of how groups move in and out of each other. And so the study of cultural broker is not to look at how a group itself stays together. We all like marshmallows, therefore we're friends. But more looking at these ideas, like the external bonds that put groups together. And so you might see people that may live in, we'll say a small town Lakefield, Massachusetts, or they might live in Houston, Texas, they might live in LA. They may all listen to the same podcast, S-Town for example, right? And so because of that, what is the kind of glue that holds all those different people who come from different places interest in this kind of thing? So we might think of podcasting and then podcasters themselves as these brokers that are learning to talk between these different groups. So as TAL itself, as, as educators, like we are constantly aware of and asking, solicit feedback from people if what we're saying is okay. If you know people, not that you, if you agree with us, but more so, are we talking in a tone that is understandable, that is open to other voices, other ideas, etc. And so this piece, I mean, I like this idea too because it's just sort of what do we as as podcasters, who who can we speak to, or anybody? And the thing is, all of us can be cultural brokers. This idea may not seem weird now because this is again 1956 when it came out. But think about the mechanism of this, right? How or what different groups do you talk to, and how do you talk across them? Do you have a ping pong friend team? Do you have an ultimate frisbee team? You have your workmates. You have your partner. You have your family. How do you talk across those different groups, right? Uh, and so maybe it's a kind of glue. I don't know, digital glue. That sounds kind of weird, but you know, why not? Uh, and then so the third piece. I want to kind of link between these two is, is that data never speaks for itself. And this is, I think, a key piece we need to, to think about is that we tend to think data has a certain imbued power to it, especially really compelling data. And we'll talk about what that means. And so this is an idea I'm adapting from Jessica O'Reilly, who's an anthropologist uh, who did work on the Antarctic. And so we'll talk about her book in a second. But she posits the idea that data always need to have a spokesperson, right? It doesn't matter what, how many points of data you have. doesn't matter what your data is doing. It can't speak for itself. It doesn't mean anything besides it's some numbers on an Excel sheet, right? So it needs spokespeople, right? And the effectiveness of this data itself has to do as much with who is presenting the data, right? And how they present it as well as what it says. And so she makes this really interesting point talking about the Antarctic. And so she's, she looks at um, what we call charismatic data. And so this is a way of how data may affect us a certain way. One of the examples that she speaks about is that, uh, for example, the, in 2006, there was a big, called B-15, part of the ice shelf, like halved off, it fell off of Antarctica and floated away. And so this was used as a, what we call a charismatic event, because it's huge, it makes you really think about it. Uh, and then it was linked to watching like, these photographs, these really beautiful photographs of this iceberg floating away, which is terrifying on its own level, linked to concerns about global climate change. Now what's interesting about that is that scientists didn't consider the calving of B-15 to be related to climate change. It was just it was an actual, actual event that's normal that would happen anyway, as pieces always have off at, at different times. But the timing of it was a really well mixed together with this like big, beautiful, and also scary, easy to see event that could be linked to other concerns. So the point isn't to say the scientists were lying, because they weren't. But the idea is to say, we have to understand data itself doesn't do anything unless you speak to it a certain way, right? And then how you present it. And so that let us understand that the way we tell stories, the way that we think about things together, will affect how we feel about the data. And what it, also what broader concerns it lets us think about, right? And so what Jessica O'Reilly says is that, you know, to, so again, to have charisma in a general sense, this is, you know, You've all probably met a charismatic individual or a rock star that you really like or your favorite podcaster or whatever, right? But to be, you know, to have charisma rights, to be favored, to be gifted or imbued with the sort of extraordinary power that you really, you know, people are just drawn to, to a charismatic figure, right? So data itself can become charismatic, she makes the argument. 
right? And this is the mix of like, have you, have you heard the term charismatic megafauna? Yeah, like in conservationist circles, this is like what you call woolly mammoths and like woolly rhinos. Because these big fuzzy animals that, that are kind of cuddly even though they're like, you know, the size of a house. Uh, but they're threatened. And so they, they speak to conservationists as well as environmental concerns. Because they're, you know, they like, it's a big plush fuzzy mammoth. So you say, oh, that means he's nice. That means we need to save the environment. Okay. So we link ideas together. Um, and so what, to, what O'Reilly says is that charismatic data are this kind of algorithm of mixing the production of facts, how we understand things, how we do science, how we do research, Natural events is reported by experts, or what we call knowledge insiders, and the way then spokespeople present them. And so these mix together and can make data charismatic the way that we, we share them. Why this matters is this, is that charismatic data can convince people to do something, right? And as simple as that sounds, that's a big deal, right? Because, oh, these numbers made me want to change my life. Crazy. Like you get a Fitbit, suddenly you have data that says, I need to stop you know, going to bed at 5 a.m., you know? Um, and so the idea is like how people present some of these kinds of data, right? Some of the information to the public in effect creates this idea of charismatic data. Um, there's a really interesting idea. So one of the examples she uses in the book that, that really struck me was that so J. Robert Oppenheimer, who invented the hydrogen bomb, uh, he at first, like when he realized the destructive potential of it, he said, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making this, when he realized how destructive it would be. But then there was this, this sort of design idea that came out called the Teller Ulam. There's this way of how to make the bomb that like fix the trigger from going off on, because the, the way he designed it, the trigger would go off on accident and that'd be really bad for everybody nearby. But so the way they set it up was that they, they made this like really beautiful trigger that he called technologically sweet. And it was such a nice design, it changed his mind about how to make the bomb. And so then he made it. Um, of course, then he famously goes on to say that I'm destroyer of worlds. Whoops. But, you know, but the idea is like charismatic data can change our minds and say, wow, I really should do something. As crazy as we would say building the hydrogen bomb because the schematic was nice, right? So this is a much more innocuous idea of TED, right? TED is premised on charismatic data, right? Every single presentation, like you have the aha moment, you've got this like this white, nice speaker of like, I learned how to save the world. He said, you can do it too. You know, and you always have this moment of saying, we, we did it, you know. If you think, if, if information has a surprise in it, that's generally an example of where someone is using charismatic data. You know? And so again, think about this American life too. Any kind of podcast that has that aha moment is based, is doing this thing too, right? And so the question is just for us to think about, like, why, how does and when does data make you change your mind? You know, and especially again, what are the presentations that, they're, you know, that we're doing it? So another piece, this episode, this is what's uh, coming out tomorrow. I, I was thinking about this idea, so I asked our guest, Christina Kilgrove, she's a bioarchaeologist and contributor to Forbes and Mental Floss, uh, uh, if we would change academic journals to be open access, because they're not right now, and I mean some of them are, but generally they're not, and like most science research is behind a paywall, you have to be part of a university, um, or a business has to pay a huge amount upfront to be able to do it. And so, as, as I was curious, you know, would, would, it, would it, in your view, you know, because since you work for Forbes and Mental Floss, would changing to open access change people's access to social science knowledge? She's like, nope, not at all. You know, I don't think so. Open accessible data is much more important than open access journals. And so she had this, this interesting idea too that I'm just, I'm thinking through that. I'd love, I'd love to know your thoughts too. That it has to do with how the data is presented again. This is what she's getting at. What do you do with the data when it's open? You know, and so and again, is it neutral? You know, data sitting out there seems like it's neutral, right? But of course, there's funding and research behind how the data came out in the first place, which is okay, just being aware of that context. And then also, if it's open, what do people do with it at that point? Uh, so this is a piece that helped me realize that, again, this has to do with writing and interpretation, too. Again, if you get a journal article, if you read a magazine or whatever, by the time we get the data to ourselves, it is, of course, interpreted, written up, hopefully in a pretty way. You know, Nat Geo just had a really awesome article that came out about, uh, they just took photographs of, under the Antarctica. And it's amazingly awesome. I recommend checking it out. Like, beautiful, beautiful photographs. 28 species of octopus down there. Who knew? You know, they're all octopotting down there, I suppose. Um, but so just to recap, this is where we made it to the end. Um, so again, I'd like to think with you all and take the idea of like podcasting as a sort of charismatic social technology. And so four pieces that we've talked about today is looking at using the anthropological toolkit of conversation and critique together to help change minds and do it in a way that says, let's look at structures, how we evaluate rather than saying this is good or bad. Operating in a digital public sphere, what does that mean? Everybody can have a voice. How do we give those spaces? Third, can we leverage the power of social brokers or cultural brokers, right? That they can talk across the group. How do we look and understand who is talking across groups and how are they doing it, right? Understand what connects people. And finally, then harnessing this power, this exceptionalism, if you will, of charismatic data to help move people to act, to help change their minds, and to see the world anew. And with that, I thank you. Uh, yes. Um, can you go back to your last one? Yes. I'm really interested in the way you're describing. First of all, I have a podcast recommendation for you. Yes. Why would I not? Of course. The most recent episode is like a 90 minute 
Yeah. On data, it's like oh, cool. I haven't, I'm the most recent episode about of Planet Money, which I didn't finish, but I've listened to 20 minutes of or so. Like I'm two thirds of the way through, is about how people change their mind around uh, data. But um, I kind of um, I'm a little bit stuck. I want to ask you more about mm -hmm. the way you think about podcasts as a tool kit for conversation and critique, and even more so as like um, this social broker, yes. cultural brokers in a way. Um, because the other ways you're kind of describing it, but while it sounds like you use the tool of conversation in your podcasts, it's you're also kind of what, what I'm hearing from you is potentially not just a conversation, but actually like a performative mm, yeah. activism to a certain degree. Yeah. That like the way you think about using your data and the way you're thinking about using your your conversations with people is not actually about the conversation mm. as much as it is about this like performative experience and yeah. so i'm curious if, like why a couple things like one where do you see performance as part of this uh charismatic social technology sure. uh and and maybe like how how does conversation kind of fit into like that that tension between actual conversation and performative yeah. conversation that's a great question um, yeah, I, I think that that's really wonderful to think with. And yeah, obviously, so yeah, when you talk about charisma, charisma has to be performed, right? Uh, and so it's it's not like you may be imbued with it, but if you, if you like show up one time and give a great speech, everyone's like, wow, you're great, and then you don't do it again, then it's it's over. You know, it has to be. And what so I'm thinking about charisma, or charisma from a sociologist named Max Weber, and one of the things he says about charisma is that it has to be exceptional. And if it becomes routinized or happens every day, it's no longer exceptional. And so there has to be this sort of uh, sort of piece that, that goes, and I think this is where performance comes into it, and I think you raise a really good question because uh, it, like podcasts are performed, if you think about it, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, and also, you know, again, if you think of, there's another uh, social theorist called Irving Goffman that talks about front stage and backstage acting, and not, the, not in theater, but like us. Like who we are right now, we're having a front stage conversation, right? We're talking, not, not because I'm on stage, but because we have a certain self we bring out to the public, and then when I go back home, I can maybe like slump in my chair and then eat my Cheetos or something, you know? And, and seem like a different person. So there is how and where we choose to act, right? And so podcasting, to me, is nice because it makes you perform, if, if, as it were, right? Because, I mean, nobody's going to listen to a podcast that's like, this is boring, you know, uh, unless you want to go to sleep, which there actually is, there is one called, there's one called Sleep With Me that the guy has a really, have you heard it? It's like, <laughs> it makes you go to sleep because he has a really, really soft voice. He talks about, he reads soup labels and, you know, like... <laughs> You know, that's a performance too, though, right? Um, and so for us, I mean, as anthropologists, our goal is to then say, what well, we need to put more voices. And so our performance is about making that conversation visible, as it were. Uh, and so really, there may not be a difference between the performative conversation and the actual conversation. You know, um, we may put them together. And, you know, I guess it just it depends on where the conversation takes place. I guess we could say that, you know? Because we'll have these conversations anyway. But then if we do them on a podcast, there's a specific space where we... For example, we try to do it in a way that does not, you know, we don't say yes or no, this is right or wrong. And that can annoy some people, but other, other times it's like, well, that's, that's not the point of this, right? And we're saying, what is the, the bigger social picture at play? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of ask you about that that last piece around um, around the aha moment, uh, charismatic data, and about not taking a stand on right or wrong. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I totally understand where you're getting at, where like life doesn't have aha moments, uh, like we don't live in a sitcom where everything gets yeah. neatly wrapped up in a, after a half an hour. However, I feel like uh, when you were talking about charismatic data, you, you came back to the, the notion of mm -hmm. aha moment, and whereas like in when you're trying to be charismatic, you're trying to get a point across. Indeed, indeed. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to talk more about that, about how do you change people's minds um, without necessarily trying to get them to believe that you are right? Yeah, that's a great question. I think part of it, so the aha moment to me is manufactured. And this is, this is the difference. That if we're having a conversation and you say this thing, I'm like, oh, that's great, but I never thought about that. There's no aha moment that we didn't, we didn't manufacture that is kind of the idea. And so... If it's an open format conversation, open conversation, then my hope would be, like, there may not, I guess the point is there might be an aha moment, but we don't manufacture it ahead of time. Right? We don't script it out. But I agree with you, because if you want to change somebody's mind or even engage somebody at all, there has to be some sort of, oh, that's, that's cool, I never thought about that, you know? Um, and so it is, there is a trick in terms of performance versus, you know, saying yay or nay to that. But I guess maybe that way, like, maybe it's not so manufactured. You know, if you can, can you non-manufacture an aha moment? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> but we've all had those conversations where you, you walk away being like, man, that's, that's a great idea, you know? So it's, it's more like maybe we, we strive to that in having a conversation. 
Um, the trick too, I mean, anthropology, it feels kind of like we're cheating sometimes because like our, our job is to say, actually, let's bring in this example from Indonesia and this example from Thailand to think about how these sort of martial art practices work. And then it's like, oh, wow, wait, you mean in Indonesia, this chicken stands for the man's masculinity? That's weird. You know, and so part of, part of our storytelling capacity is just collecting stories from around the world. So they, on their own level, have sort of an aha thing just because they're different, I guess. But we hope not to manufacture those, I suppose, if that makes sense. Yeah, does that, does that make sense, sir? Cool. Happy to dive in more if, if you like. Any other questions? Great question. Um, actually, so the episode that's coming out tomorrow is on anthropology. Uh, actually, last week was on anthropology versus journalism. And so there's a great quote by, by Sarah Kenzador, she's an anthropologist, that says, the anthropology is journalism that takes too long. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, which I agree with. I agree with you know. So, like, there's there's a difference in terms of how long we spend studying with people, but and then also who we tend to write for. So, while the observational research may not be different, um, the time length is different. You know, and then also there is this question of the aha moment because even journalism too is about what's the, what's the thing. Sometimes anthropology is like there is no thing. You know, we're just here talking. You know, uh, yeah. So that's our hope. How did you get over the hump? Great question. Well, because we, our friends and our, our parents probably listen first. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, hey, thanks, mom. Good to, good to hear from you again. You know, I don't understand this point. Yeah, we, I mean, because we did it at, at um, as students at Brandeis. We would broadcast on campus, and that helped because it was already like, oh, this is a Brandeis thing. You know, yeah. And then we like we like then escaped from school. Um, you know, but it's interesting because even like there was actually a gap of like two. I know it's gonna sound weird, but there's a gap of two years between like doing it through the WBRS radio studio and then doing it purely online. And uh, we now get a lot of comments, but they tend to be after the fact. Like, again, we put the episode out, and then people will tweet to us and say ideas. So it's again, it's like it's asynchronous, as as it were, you know. But this is why we're saying it'd be cool if we can get back to doing live streaming, uh, so that people can tweet in. Because Facebook Live is actually really quite underused, underutilized technology that's super easy that people can like tweet and not tweet, and they wouldn't tweet on Facebook, but they can, you know, was it Facebook you, or like or down like or whatever while you're talking. So, um, but great question. I mean, part of it, yeah, sometimes you're just talking to yourself, you know. Like a conversation in the mirror, I guess, you know. But just trying to figure it out as we go along. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a question. Uh, when you grouped the podcasts into different categories, yeah. I noticed that, that most of the podcasts that I listen to belong to the scripted stories. Mm -hmm. um, I think that actually brings uh, like a missing gap in what you have talked about that I'm struggling to understand. That is, like, on one hand, we do want to hear more conversations and from different yeah. perspectives to have that openness in it. But when you keep that open, this, this conversation t tend to be less dramatic and less yes. charismatic. Yes. That's why like, I kind of enjoyed scripted story in the mm -hmm. sense that the, those uh, journalists podcasters, they already did the, um, they became the spokesman uh, for those more like more plain and more boring data points and they made a charismatic story for me. So I, I kind of feel like there is a, like it's hard to um, balance these two sides that like if you want to really have like conversation, have like open-minded critique, to talk about things, you might have to kind of suffer through some of the plainness and boringness and and because not everyone who participated in the conversation is a great performer yes. or a great speaker and but you still will try to understand their point um, whereas like sometimes if you really just want to uh, understand something and uh, like just to have a joy ride with the author or with the presenter of the data like you just want someone to just a uh, pre digest those conversations, those data yeah. points for me? And how do you see about that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, too. I mean, so part of it, I don't know if anybody reads anthropology journals, but I think they're boring, and I have to read them for work. Um, and so part of our, our work in this is that we digest that kind of information. We digest academic information and make that manageable as part of our conversational pushes. And so um, it is true because I agree with you. Like I, I mean, I love I love this American life too. You know, I'm I'm not, I'm not hating on any of these kind. Of, these are all these are all have important parts in, in podcast land. You know, 
Um, but yeah, so for us, it's, it's kind of like we may take a different kind of information and digest it before you, but the thing is, you don't see that. And that's why it can be tricky to say, but I think you're right, like, anthropology itself has been said to be the study of boring everyday life, and it is. Because it's like, actually, some of the most cool insights that we get about humanity happen in the everyday life when you don't think about it, you know? It's the way, if, you, if you've done any observation or research, it's the way that you use your soap when you wash your hands. It's the way you pick out the products on the shelf in the store. You know, it's the way that you talk to your mom differently than you talk to your best friend. It's those things is actually where we find these insights about what it means to be human. And so, to me, again, I mean, I'm feeling kind of aha y about the idea of that anyway. So it's like you can't avoid it on one level. And like the point is not to not, not, not have an aha moment, but to recognize that there is a format that podcasting should have. It, it can help to like have that kind of thing. Because agree, like if it's just me talking to you, that would be probably pretty boring. Because if I'm just rambling at you, it's like what, what, is, the, what is the point of this, this episode, you know? Um, and so we do, you format it enough to like try to have that idea, but I think you're right. Like, um, and so we, we, on the website, talk about the, we think of this as like man, making complexity manageable. Since we take, like everyday life may be boring, but it's also super complex. And so that by itself is more interesting than like, we're talking about soap today. But it's more like, what does soap do for people? What does it tell you about germ theory? And you know, why we didn't have soap 90 years ago and X, Y, and that kind of stuff. So it's like, to me, there's a lot of interesting facts in the everyday minutia. Uh, and so part of it is, I guess, how do we tell those those stories, I suppose, you know? Yeah. So, very interesting talk. Um, and I was actually kind of curious for you, as someone who's still a PhD candidate, where do you see anthropology and you know, podcasting having an impact or a change in purpose in terms of, for example, in the most recent... U.S. elections, for example. Um, I'm sure most of you who are on Facebook probably saw very polarizing perspectives. And I personally, for one, um, chose not to visit Facebook for a good three months during that time period. And, you know, like, I, I work as a data scientist, and I see articles posted where, you know, I'm sure you're also familiar with spurious correlations. Yeah. And I've got one stat here. You know, total revenue generated by arcades has a 98.5% correlation with computer science doctorates awarded in the United States, right? <laughs> and we all have that one friend who's going to say, well, you know, revenue generated by arcades means that more people is going to arcades. Does that you know, mean that you know, arcades are making people smarter because you're using your brain more, therefore more computer science doctorates, right? Yeah. So you're going to have someone who's going to make that really long connection, and then you try to tell them, well, no, you know, correlation doesn't imply causation. And then immediately shut you down, defriend you on Facebook, and say you're a horrible person, <laughs> right? Cool. So where do you see anthropology and podcasting kind of opening people's perspectives to new and different ideas, and you know, changing the way people think about different perspectives? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question. I mean, I, I think that you know, so anthropology itself is is this study of, of if you want to call it human difference, right? And like. And so, how do we take, because we primarily do qualitative data too, you know, so it would be observational research or long-term ethnographic stuff, and then we'll use some data points also that we can get from quantitative things. And uh, to me, I mean, podcasting is a sort of just a fun way to do it because you can't do it in a way that's like hyper-academic, right? Um, and so, part of it too, like actually that'd be a great episode itself, is like causation does not equal correlation or vice versa, you know, so it's like what do we do about those two things? Uh, and uh, particularly if like, in the case of Barcades too, like just understanding how groups make decisions, I guess we could say. For example, like I was reading yesterday on, on LinkedIn that there was uh, a company that is starting to use algorithms instead of resumes to hire people. That's kind of terrifying, right? But also kind of like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, why not? This person will be a better match than that person. But then you lose something about the human in there. And so like um, Yuval Harai, who is a, is a really interesting historian. He wrote, he wrote the book called Sapiens that came out last year, and the new one called Homo Deus, which I just finished. Awesome book. Talks a lot about what he calls the religion of dataism, and that how like everything is algorithm in this idea, and that everything is pattern and data dataable. Everything should be part of the data cloud, which is the new god in, in this perspective. You know, uh, and that's kind of terrifying on one level because he's like, are we going to make ourselves irrelevant? But the anthropological side is like, we can't. You know, <laughs> I mean, Terminator might happen, or the Matrix, maybe, but, um, or some people argue that we're already in the simulation. If we are, then sorry, we're screwed. But, um, you know, I, I think that by, by maintaining a focus on the human side of things itself, like, we can then say, okay, well, where does this data come from, right? And this is, again, the charismatic part, because if somebody says, ah, oh, well, this barcade obviously means that people are smart, it's like, well, let's look, where is that data coming from, right? And so it's not so much that the fact is, this is the crazy thing, this is going to sound weird, the facts are unstable. Right? As much as, and it's not that I call fake news versus like a real news or something, but the idea is like facts themselves are social facts, if, if you will, right? And they have to be said and be made true by somebody who can interpret them, right? Uh, and so to me, as anthropologists, we can just say, well, is this true everywhere? 
You know, and this is one of the things that Bruno Latour, an anthropologist, helped me realize, because I do science and technology studies, and one of the things that he said was that uh, one of the questions just to ask yourself, is science the same everywhere? And it isn't, which just sounds crazy to us, because the empirical method of how we you know, observe and we do hypothesis testing, like that might be the same, but what we find is always different. And so because of that, we have to understand that how we interpret it is always part of that case. The thing is, this is the thing, like data is never, oops, data is never neutral, right? And so part of us, I guess, hope we can just have that conversation. As a podcaster, I mean, like, I don't know how, Ben's how good we are at marketing, I guess, you know, because there is this piece, too. Like, can we get the message out there is the question. Um, the positive thing is it seems people respond to it, <laughs> you know. Um, but know, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to think further about that, too. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. All right. We're a little bit running out of time. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, yeah. for being here. Thanks, everyone in the audience. Thank you.